Welcome to Ancient World Studies. My name is Dr. Raoul McLaughlin. Herod the Great was a Roman client king. He supported the first Emperor Augustus in order to preserve his Judean kingdom. He is best known from biblical accounts and is remembered as a cruel tyrant who brutally suppressed challenges to his royal power. This included executions and political murders that targeted the members of previous royal dynasties, religious leaders, and even members of his own family. In these political intrigues, one of the important tools at King Herod's disposal was a loyal bodyguard of Celtic soldiers. The question is, who were Herod's Celtic henchmen? In ancient times, Celtic people and their cultures dominated much of Western Europe. In the 3rd century BC, there was a large-scale migration of Celtic tribes into Balkan territories located to the north of Greece. These warriors arrived to settle with their families, and their identity was well preserved in the region for multiple generations. These incoming Celts were permitted to remain in certain areas and were paid by Greco-Macedonian kings to undertake military services. The Greeks and Romans often called these people Gauls, because they recognised that these tribes shared a common identity with the Celtic nations in ancient Gaul, modern France. These Celts played an important role in the Macedonian Wars of Succession, in which rival royal candidates fought for control over the Macedonian kingdom. They found service in the armies of King Pyrrhus of Epirus, who conducted campaigns in this region. Celtic mercenaries were also employed by the Seleucid kings, who ruled a Near Eastern realm encompassing Syria and Western Iran. According to the Roman historian Justin, these kings of the East would conduct all their wars with a mercenary force of Celts. If they were driven from their thrones, they would seek protection from the Celts. The Celtic name invoked terror, and their military skills provided dependable good fortune. Consequently, Royal claimants could not securely maintain their power or recover their lost position without the assistance of Celtic valour. Justin, History, Book 25, Passage 2 The Ptolemaic kings in Egypt also recognised the military skills of these Celtic forces and used them to resolve their own civil war. In 277 BC, Ptolemy II, Philadelphus, recruited 4,000 Celtic mercenaries to defeat his half-brother Magus. But after the rebellion was crushed, the Celtic mercenaries plotted to seize power. They were deceived by Ptolemy, led out to an island outpost on the Nile, and blockaded until they starved to death. Some may have taken their own lives as an alternative. In this era, an offshoot of the Celtic migrants crossed from the Balkans into Anatolia, Asia Minor. Large numbers of these Galatae settled in the highlands of central Anatolia, where they formed a distinct population known as the gallo Graeci, Gallic Greeks. The scale of this migration is suggested by the number of Celtic military forces entering Greco-Macedonian service during this period. King Nicomedes I of Bithynia is reported to have bought the services of 20,000 adult Galatians, of which 10,000 were armed men. In the 2nd century BC, the Galatians were said to have mobilised more than 50,000 fighting men to oppose the Romans and their Greek allies. A Celtic force of 50,000 able-bodied fighting men would suggest a Galatian population of more than 20,000 adults and adolescents. Roman sources describe these Galatian people as tall compared with most Mediterranean populations. Many of their warriors also possessed distinctive red hair. Livy reports Roman impressions shortly before a decisive battle. He writes, This was an enemy dreaded by all people in that part of the world, and they were ready for war. The Roman consul Supreme Commander, arranged his soldiers and delivered the following speech. Soldiers, I am well aware that these Celts have the highest military reputation of all the peoples in Western Asia. This fierce nation, 
after roving and fighting across much of the world, have settled amongst the most peaceful people. Their appearance and all their acts are intended to terrify and appall you. Their tall stature, their long red hair, their huge shields, and their extraordinary long swords. More so are their songs, as they enter battle, their war whoops and performances, and the horrible clash of weapons, as they shake their shields in the way their forefathers did before them. Livy, History, Book 38, Passage 17, Battle, 189 BC. These gallo Greci preserved their unique culture for many centuries. They appear in the New Testament as the Galatians, who received a letter of instructions regarding faith from the Apostle Paul. In the first century BC, the Galatians supported the Pontic king Mithridates VI in his war against the Roman Republic. Celtic commanders and warrior units remained loyal to the king until his final defeat by the Romans and the betrayal of his royal household. It was reported that Mithridates had developed a resistance to most popular poisons through deliberately exposing himself to small doses of toxins over a long period of time. Consequently, when all hope of victory or escape was lost, he appealed to a loyal Celtic officer to assist him in suicide. Appian reports, Seeing Betuitus, an officer of the Celts, Mithridates said to him, I have benefited much from your right arm against my enemies, but I shall profit from it most of all, if you will kill me now. Save me from the danger of being led in a Roman triumph. I have been an autocrat for many years, the ruler of a great kingdom. But now I cannot die from poison, because I have foolishly fortified myself against this danger. I have kept watch and been on guard against all the poisons that can be ingested. But I have not protected myself from that domestic poison, always the most dangerous threat to kings, the treachery of military forces, children and friends. Loyal to the end, Appian writes, Hearing this appeal, Betuitus rendered the king the final service that he desired, death. Appian, Mithridates, Passage 111 In this era, there were other means by which Celtic soldiers could find service in the eastern Mediterranean. General Julius Caesar completed the conquest of Gaul in the 50s BC, and consequently large numbers of elite Celtic cavalry were recruited into the Roman army. When the Roman general Crassus invaded the Parthian Empire, in 53 BC, he led an army that included Celtic cavalry units from Gaul. Crassus was ambushed on the desert plains of northern Iraq by a horde of mounted Parthian archers supported by heavily armoured lancers known as cataphracts. During the attack, the Gallic cavalry took part in a heroic last stand. The lightly equipped Gauls were no match for their armour-encased opponents equipped with superior steel weaponry. In heroic desperation, Gallic riders who had been thrown from their saddles tried to stab at the unprotected underbelly of armoured enemy horses, only to be trampled to death in the attempt. This was a total defeat for the Romans, but it secured the reputation of the Celtic cavalry as steadfast troops who would fight heroically to the death against overwhelming odds. It is around this period that the Egyptian queen Cleopatra received a bodyguard of elite Celtic soldiers. The queen had a famous love affair with Julius Caesar, at a time when the general was establishing himself as a dictator in Rome. Caesar could have given Cleopatra this Celtic unit as a political honour and as protection against palace intrigue. In 44 BC, Caesar was murdered by his political rivals at a senatorial meeting. As Rome descended into civil war, Cleopatra returned to her palaces in Alexandria. She was probably accompanied by her bodyguard. When this divisive conflict had ended, Mark Antony took command of Roman forces in the eastern Mediterranean. 
He too began a love affair with Queen Cleopatra, and subsequently made Alexandria his base of operations in the east. According to Plutarch, Antony received reinforcement Roman units from Gaul and Spain to conduct his own high-risk campaign against Parthia. Perhaps the royal Celtic bodyguard that protected the Egyptian queen originates from this period. Antony might have reasoned that new Celtic recruits would be disinterested in factional Roman politics and Egyptian palace intrigues. According to Josephus, the royal bodyguard included 400 troops and was therefore the size of a small urban garrison. It would have guarded an entire palace complex and royal household, as well as providing close personal protection within the court and private apartments. In 31 BC, the Roman commander Octavian defeated the joint forces of Antony and Cleopatra at the Sea Battle of Actium in western Greece. The couple fled back to Egypt, abandoning their land-based forces and eastern allies. King Herod of Judea had been a supporter of Antony and therefore expected harsh treatment from Octavian. Overcoming his concerns, he travelled in person to the island of Rhodes, where Octavian had established a command post. Approaching Octavian, Herod symbolically laid aside his crown and fully acknowledged his previous loyalty to Antony. He asked Octavian to carefully consider his previous character and his faithful conduct. Herod is reported to have said, My hope and appeal is to your virtue. Consider how faithful a friend I have been, and not whose friend I have been. Octavian took careful measure of the situation before responding. You will be protected and kept in the position of king more securely than you were before, for you are worthy to reign over a great many subjects due to the steadfastness of your friendship. Try to be equally consistent in your faithfulness to me, for my success will improve my disposition towards you. With this agreement in place, Herod returned to Judea and offered all possible support to Octavian's armies as they advanced towards Alexandria. When all hope was lost, Antony committed suicide with a self-inflicted sword thrust to his abdomen, and Queen Cleopatra retreated to her royal mausoleum with her closest female servants. There is no mention of the Celtic bodyguards in the surviving Roman accounts, so perhaps Cleopatra dismissed their services as Octavian's legions advanced into the city. Or perhaps they defected. Sources suggest that Cleopatra hoped for clemency by abandoning any futile resistance. Perhaps she planned to beguile Octavian through feminine persuasion and flattery. Cleopatra had sent her young son, Caesarion, to the Red Sea port of Berenike, where he was instructed to find safe passage to India. Caesarion was the heir to the Ptolemaic kingdom and reportedly the son of Julius Caesar. If he was protected by members of the royal Celtic bodyguard, they do not feature in the limited accounts that survive. According to Plutarch, Caesarion was persuaded to return to Alexandria by a treacherous royal adviser named Rhodon. The royal youth believed false reports that Octavian might spare him and guarantee his royal inheritance. But Octavian, the adopted son of Caesar, could not risk this alternative challenge to his political status. When Caesarion arrived in Alexandria, he was separated from his companions, taken into custody, and executed. Despite the dissolution of the Ptolemaic dynasty, the royal Celtic bodyguard remained in existence as an intact military unit with specialist experience. Augustus had his own unit of personal bodyguards called the Custodes. These were recruited from elite Germanic warriors occupying the northern Roman frontiers. In addition, he was probably reluctant to trust Celtic troops that had served a former adversary. Octavian therefore gifted Cleopatra's Celtic bodyguard to King Herod to reward him for his generous support 
in the final stages of the war. Josephus explains. It was the opinion of Octavian and his soldiers that Herod's kingdom was too small for the generous support he had given them. Therefore, when Octavian was in Egypt and Cleopatra and Antony were dead, he bestowed many marks of honour upon Herod. He added to his kingdom by giving Herod the territories which Cleopatra had taken from him. He gave him Gadara and Hippos and Samaria and the maritime cities of Gaza and Anthedon and Joppa and Stratos Tower. He also presented Herod with a personal bodyguard of 400 Gauls who had served Cleopatra. Josephus, Jewish War, Book 20, Passage 3 This Celtic bodyguard was an important tool in preserving Herod's security and political position. In addition, these foreigners were not directly subject to Jewish prohibitions and could act in a ruthless manner without incurring religious sanction. Herod was not part of a long-standing royal dynasty, and he was therefore fearful of plots and conspiracies involving rival Jewish aristocrats, religious leaders, military officers, and even other members of the royal household. Herod's father had been murdered by poisoning, and he was fearful of suffering a similar fate. He therefore subjected members of his household and leading officials to close surveillance. One of the issues affecting his security was that Herod had married Mariamne, a Hasmonean princess who belonged to a rival royal dynasty that had previously ruled Judea. Members of the Hasmonean dynasty were popular with the public, well connected to the higher escalons of Judean society, and had political ties to rulers in neighbouring kingdoms. Mariamne had a younger brother, named Aristobulus III, who was popular among the Jewish people and seen as a potential candidate for kingship. In 36 BC, under orders from Antony and Cleopatra, Herod was forced to dismiss the high priest of Jerusalem and appoint Aristobulus to the senior religious position. Aristobulus was just 17 years old, but he received widespread goodwill and popular support when he led an important religious festival in Jerusalem, the Feast of Tabernacles. Herod was so alarmed by this public response that he planned the death of Aristobulus. According to Josephus, the boy was summoned to a royal residence in Jericho that was frequented by few people who might provide contrary accounts to a tragic accident that was to be arranged for the boy. Throughout the visit, Herod was careful to maintain a pretense of friendliness towards his guest, but a trap had been set. On a particularly hot day, Herod permitted his personal servants and close acquaintances to cool themselves by playing and swimming in the large fish ponds installed at the estate. At first, Aristobulus was just an observer to these events, but as evening approached, Herod encouraged the youth to join the others in the pools. Josephus reports, Herod had appointed some of his acquaintances to seize and fully submerge the youth as he was swimming. In the evening darkness, they plunged him under the water as though in sport or play, and they held him there until he had drowned. Thus Aristobulus was murdered, having lived seventeen years, and holding the high priesthood for less than a year. Josephus, Jewish Antiquities, Book 15, Passage 3 But Josephus also provides another account of the killing, based on accusations made by Mariamne just a few years later. According to Mariamne, Herod already had some trusted Celtic bodyguards under his command, who were instrumental in the murder. She believed that her brother had been seized and drowned by these Celtic soldiers, and the night swimming accident was merely a cover story. Perhaps the youth had been drowned in a vat to ensure there were no obvious marks of violence on his body that could invoke pity or engender outrage. Maybe Mariamne relied on informants, believed popular rumours, or was influenced by her own deep suspicions. It is known that Celtic peoples conducted ritual sacrifices in sacred pools. These scenes are depicted on Celtic artworks 
such as the Gundestrup cauldron. The bodyguards would not have objected to a murder conducted in this manner, even if it involved a high-status religious leader. Mariamne possibly learnt or guessed what had occurred, and this is said to have fueled her hatred and resentment of her husband. Josephus reports, Mariamne openly reproached Herod for what he had done to her brother, Aristobulus. She said that Herod had not spared Aristobulus, even though he was still a child. He had given him the high priesthood at the age of seventeen, but he had killed him soon after he had conferred this dignity upon him. It was said that when Aristobulus put on the holy vestments to approach the altar at a festival, a multitude of people in great crowds cried out in gratitude. So Herod sent the child by night to Jericho, and there, on Herod's command, Aristobulus was submerged by the Gauls in a pool until he was drowned. Josephus, Jewish War But this event occurs before the Celtic bodyguards are attested as being with Herod. Are they being blamed because of their reputation? Or was Herod already using Celtic troops for special operations before he was given the royal bodyguard by Octavian? Perhaps Herod had lingering fears that Octavian might restore the Hasmonean dynasty. The gift of the Celtic bodyguard was a public offering that signalled the emperor's support for his new ally and his commitment to defend him from political intrigues. Many of the operations undertaken by this Celtic bodyguard must have been clandestine, so their actions go mainly unrecorded or unrecognised in the surviving testimonies. Through political strategy and imperial support, Herod survived the many threats to his life and royal position. But he had a turbulent reign involving numerous acts of intrigue and political killings. He finally succumbed to a debilitating illness in old age, but not before guaranteeing the survival of his dynasty. One of his final acts was to arrange the execution of his eldest son, Antipater, who had been convicted on charges of sedition. Josephus also claims that to guarantee his legacy, Herod planned to kill a large group of Jewish leaders who were seized by his soldiers and detained in the Hippodrome, the Greek-style horse-racing stadium. These prominent people only escaped immediate execution because Herod's successors did not fulfil his intentions. Josephus describes the elaborate funeral procession arranged for King Herod. The entire army was assembled, with the bodyguards and foreign regiments positioned in places of honour closest to the king. Josephus reports, The king was laid out on a purple bed on a gold bier, decorated with precious stones. A diadem was placed upon his head, a crown of gold above it, and a scepter in his right hand. Close to him were his sons and his numerous relations. The soldiers next to them were dressed in the clothing of their different countries and cultures. First came the royal guards, then Herod's Thracian regiment, then the German unit, then the Gallic soldiers. Each was armed and dressed in full war gear. The whole army marched behind these troops in the same manner that they used to go to war. Josephus, Antiquities, Book 17, Passage 8, Section 3. The ancient world was a complex, interconnected system, and many other powerful rulers selected foreign troops as their trusted personal bodyguards. This included the German corps that guarded the Julio-Claudian emperors, and the Roman soldiers attested in the service of Tamil kings from the southern realms of India. These will be the subject of future lectures. Thank you for your attention.